My name is John Brooks. I work with uh, USDA, ARS at uh, Mississippi State uh, uh, location. And uh, what I'm going to talk to you guys today is about uh, the land application of uh, two types of, of manure and uh, uh, Class B municipal biosolids. And we're looking at those influences on pathogens, indicator bacteria, and antibiotic resistance. So 2015, we know that 2015 is the international year of soils. And uh, there was an editorial in Science uh, maybe about a month ago, six weeks ago, give or take, somewhere around there, uh, by Wall and Six. And it was a really uh, succinctly and eloquently written editorial that basically summarizes that overall our soils are still degrading. Uh, about one third of our soils are still degrading. And one of the key aspects that we're losing in our soils is organic matter. And organic matter is one of the, it's the lifeblood of so many of these soils. And when you remove that, you remove the efficiency of all these uh, soils and really our ability to feed the world, to feed uh, whether it's crop production, whether it is uh, uh, livestock production, but you remove all that. The reason we have an interest in uh, organic matter, because it's only a small percentage of, of soil. Uh, mass. It's only less than 5% of the soil mass is organic matter. But the reason we're so interested in that organic matter is because it feeds the biological fraction of soil. All right? and, bio and the biological fraction is bacteria, fungi, uh, protozoa, uh, uh, other eukaryotes, and of course viruses. And being a microbiologist myself, I consider this to be the master of the universe. Okay, So the biology, the soil biology is the master of everything that is going on above ground. So everything that you see is really all being controlled at some level by microorganisms and by the soil biology. So you take away that organic matter, you take away its food source, and now this information but microbiological superhighway that's underneath our feet uh, is raw. Okay? And they can no longer have their fun, they can't have their sex anymore, they can't make babies, they can't talk to each other, they can't uh, uh, communicate with each other, they can't dance anymore, they can't do the things that they're supposed to do to make everything above ground uh, better for us, right? So we've got to talk about a few ways of putting organic matter back into the system. Now, we know of our conservation practices, uh, soil uh, conservation uh, practices, no-till soils, these sorts of things, uh, and they work. But they work to really just maintain and keep organic matter in the system. But we're talking about adding organic matter back into the system. So cover crops, that's one approach that you can do this. But what we're going to focus in on is application of swine effluent, uh, application of broiler litter, and land application of bile solids. And specifically, we're going to talk about Class B bile solids. Now, uh, Dr. Barry went into some of the uh, breakdown of bile solids. I'm not going to go too much into that, other than to tell you that, uh, for the most part, bile solids and CAFO, and I call them organic waste residuals because I, I don't like the waste aspect because they, they're not a waste product. They're actually quite uh, uh, nutritious products. There's a lot of organic matter in these things. And that goes for, for both the biosolid aspect and for the CAFO uh, residuals. And, and as Andy said, they're not organic uh, because you have antibiotics in there and whatnot. So they don't classify as organic, but we're just calling it that. But we got to compare and contrast them because when we put these out, uh, and we land apply them, there is some inherent risk associated with them. Uh, I'm a microbiologist, so I always look at the pathogen side of things and the ecological side of things. So there is some inherent risk. And it boils down to uh, some of the treatment aspects. So class B and class A biosolids. When we talk about biosolids, these are the two classes that were established by the EPA Part 503 rule in 1993. And these two classes, just like in school, class A, A is always the best. That's the same situation here. Class A biosolids are treated to a point where you no longer have detectable pathogens by our techniques, culture techniques. Uh, you no longer have detectable pathogens. Your indicator levels are very low as well. Class B, on the other hand, reasonably you can expect to detect pathogens in Class B. There really is no comparable rules or regulations that guide uh, uh, manures. All right? And we do know that manures are going to be pretty varied. Uh, you can have uh, chicken litter, you can have swine effluent, cow manure, dairy manure, cattle manure, uh, turkey, uh, horse, whatever, goat. There's a lot of different manures out there. And, and when you look at the overall breakdown of, of the microbiology, the pathogens associated with manures, um, 
for the most part, the way it breaks down is this. If you can uh, defecate it, it's pretty much going to be there. If it's excreted, it can be there. Potentially, it can be there. And for the pathogens from our side, from the human standpoint, from the municipal standpoint, for instance, that includes influenza, that includes rhinovirus, that includes a bunch of different viruses. That's the key difference between biosolids and manure. Generally speaking, when we're talking about biosolids, there's going to be potentially viruses in those biosolids. You're not going to find these guys, the adenoviruses, enteroviruses, you're not going to find them necessarily in manure. There's a few instances where we have found like hepatitis E and stuff like that in, in, in uh, manure, but generally speaking, you're not going to find them. Where manure tips the scale towards, uh, towards itself is in the presence of bacterial pathogens. Oftentimes, you're going to find bacterial pathogens at a few orders of magnitude greater than what you find in bile solids. And that's really inherent to the treatment associated with uh, bile solids. If you took raw uh, sewage sludge uh, and you correct it for the moisture content, uh, you probably have comparable numbers to what you have in the manure. Uh, but the fact is that bile solids are treated to a certain degree, and that's why you see a loss in those numbers there. So that brings us to our current research. Where are we right now? Well, for the most part, the research that myself have conducted, my advisors at the University of Arizona uh, conducted, and, and other colleagues throughout the uh, country, um, basically we tend to, tended to focus on one uh, uh, waste residual or the other. Uh, in this case, Hutchinson's uh, papers, he did, or she did, I'm not sure if he or she, but uh, they did focus in on a few different uh, uh, waste uh, residuals, but uh, for the most part, that's the exception. Generally speaking, everyone else tended to focus in on one waste, either biosolids, class B biosolids, or either manure, chicken litter, either affluent, these sorts of things. But where we want to go is get a true comparison uh, on a land application study uh, basis. So, and because we ultimately want to get to a risk assessment associated with these. And so the purpose of the study uh, was to facilitate a comparison at field and bench scales. I'm only going to talk about the field work. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea that we, we're looking at pathogens, indicators, antibiotic resistance, uh, some ecology, uh, some of the plant uh, uh, distribution, uh, nutrients, but I'm only talking about the, the micro stuff uh, today. So our experimental design uh, was a small plot study. Uh, it was set up on some forage plots uh, located in Mississippi uh, on one of our cooperator farms. It's a randomized complete block design, five treatments with four reps. Uh, the five treatments included uh, biosolids, poultry litter, uh, two types of effluent application where we uh, did a surface application, and then another application where we uh, used a disc to, to basically cut into the, uh, into the soil and sort of do an incorporation uh, of the effluent. Um, and then, uh, of course, our control, uh, which received no uh, fertilizer treatment. As far as microbial assays, uh, we looked at heterotrophic plate count bacteria, the HPCs, gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, Clostridium perfringens. Uh, these are all culture uh, methods, by the way. Uh, we did some presence-absence work for E. coli, generic E. coli, uh, Listeria, uh, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and we did this in 10 grams of soil. And the reason for that is because we were generally going into this expecting that we weren't going to detect uh, very many of these, uh, these guys, even though we wanted to, but we're generally going to not find them. Uh, and we were kind of aware of that. Some of our uh, molecular assays, uh, we use quantitative PCR to de detect 16S uh, ribosomal RNA. Uh, we use quantitative PCR to detect class 1 integron uh, genes. And, and those are the two I'm going to talk about today for interest of time. But we also did measure uh, some of these other guys up there as well. Uh, we used the Curry Kirby Bauer disk diffusion uh, approach to develop antibiograms. I'm only going to talk about E. coli antibiograms today, but we are also working on Clostridium and Staphylococcus and uh, Salmonella antibiograms as well. So, getting into the data. Um, for the most part, starting out uh, with heterotrophic plate count bacteria with HPCs. HPCs is a good thing to measure because it gives you a general perspective on how the soil is responding, how the microbial quality of the soil is responding to a particular treatment. And for the most part, we see that and this is a log scale uh, uh, CFUs per gram uh, versus time in weeks uh, following application. For the most part, we see that it's a, a, a cyclical thing. You have a, a rapid rise and increase. This is due to a rain event, uh, increase in moisture content, uh, followed by a, a period of dryness. 
and then of course another rapid increase. And that's really what you'll generally see with HPCs, uh, is that they're going to follow the moisture content of the soil, and that's what we saw. That there, there's some rain events here that are uh, causing it to increase and decrease, but no treatment effect, and, and that's what we kind of expected with HPCs. Um, we did look at uh, 16S, piece, uh, 16S ribosomal RNA. Uh, this would be comparable to this time point right here. And once again, we don't really see a treatment effect uh, there as well. Looking at year two, uh, year two, the data is a little bit more wonky. This looks more dramatic than what it actually is, this drop. Uh, this is less than a log uh, drop, but it, it looks far more dramatic than what it is. It's actually not that big of a drop. Uh, but one thing that was the outlier here is that uh, the poultry litter treatment plots uh, did uh, sustain a little bit more readily than the other plots did. Uh, year three kind of went back to the way uh, uh, what we saw in year one with the increase, decrease, increase uh, in time uh, uh, there. Looking at some of the other bacterial groups, uh, gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, the gram-positive bacteria, we do see uh, some of the treatments starting to kind of tease themselves out. Uh, the poultry litter treatment uh, tended to be our, our early riser here. Uh, it tended to be the one that uh, uh, stayed up a little bit longer than the others. Um, and, and that was typical of what we kind of would have expected with poultry litter. The poultry litter does have quite a bit of staphylococcus in it or staphylococcal-like uh, groups. And we, we expect this number to stay up there and it surely did. Um, Gram-negative bacteria, uh, sort of the same trend overall, poultry litter, once again, was kind of the early riser. Uh, but uh, in this case, though, gram-negative bacteria, uh, and you can't really see this from, from this broad perspective, but gram-negative bacteria did have a little bit more of that cyclical uh, trend with the exception of poultry litter, which just went up like that and stayed up. Uh, but gram-negative bacteria had more of that uh, rise with uh, moisture content uh, following sort of what we saw with the HPC data. And so it behaved more zymogenously than, than what you expect with some of the other uh, bacteria. Can you give an example of a gram-positive bacteria? So in this case, uh, what we were using was a manitol salt auger. Uh, so we're measuring a lot of staphylococcus, uh, micrococcus, bacillus, uh, some of the big hitters that are readily and easily <coughs> cultured uh, uh, with, that, with uh, those t uh, particular media. Uh, Clostridium perfringens. This is one of my near and dear favorites. Not a lot of people necessarily like to, to work with it because it's an anaerobic bug uh, of anaerobic uh, bacterium. It's a spore former, but it's, it's one heck of a good uh, indicator. Uh, I think it is. Uh, a lot of people don't like it because it persists for such a long time, but I, I tend to like it uh, as, as an indicator. Once again, with treatments, we do see that with Clostridium perfringens, uh, it, it teases out a lot of the treatments. Biosolids, the, the effluent applications and poultry litter uh, saw uh, quite uh, large increases of two logs or more uh, following application uh, of, of these particular uh, treatments, especially for year one. For year two, Clostridium provisions actually in poultry litter seems to be somewhat transient and depends on whether or not that particular uh, flock was sick. Uh, and that tends to be what, we, what we're seeing is that Clostridium, it, it's, a, it's a cause of some uh, of gastroenteritis in, in uh, uh, poultry, gastrodermatitis, I think is what it's called, in, in poultry. And so uh, because of that problem, um, uh, we tend to find Clostridium perfringens in poultry litter pretty often, more often than not. Uh, so when it's there, it's there. Uh, but when it's not, it's, it's not there. In year and two and year, and year three, uh, we didn't see any Clostridium perfringens in our particular poultry litter, so the levels uh, were below uh, control plots. But that was the next thing, is that our control plots, we did find Clostridium perfringens in our control plots. Uh, and this, you know, it's indicative. These are open fields. It seems like as soon as we put out poultry litter, it attracts every single feral animal out to that plot. So we had everything out there, and we could see them readily. There's, there's deer that run through there. There are uh, uh, wild hogs that run through there. There's wild, plenty of wild dogs that run through there and sniff around through the poultry litter. So, uh, we had plenty of, uh, of wild animals there, and we have a feeling that that kind of confounded some of our uh, results. But what we like to do is, is sort of just look at a point in time uh, for these particular treatments. Rather than look at that whole scale, uh, we wanted to kind of get away from some of the noise and look at a point in time and see what each individual treatment is doing. In this case, we're looking at gram-positive bacteria. 
uh, early on in the studies, year one, and this is year two, week zero, week two, and we see that poultry litter is the dominant uh, uh, source of gram-positive bacteria. Uh, looking at Clostridium perfringens, we see that bile solids is dominant there. There is early on, we do see an influence of the effluent, uh, but that does tend to uh, fade away over time. Looking at our class one integron data, this data is a little bit more complicated, and I've had difficulty looking at it, but it leads me to think, are these integron levels that we're detecting, are they cyclical, uh, following, uh, meaning that they're already there? Are we just looking at basically an offshoot of the HPC data where they're just following along with the moisture level um, uh, over time? Uh, because we did detect them at low levels in our background samples before we started the study. Um, but by year one, after we applied and, and at the end of the study, uh, we got into, uh, we see that at the end, actually it was for year two, at the very beginning of year two, we see that the levels had shot up uh, about three logs. Uh, so, so it was a fairly substantial increase. Went from about 10 to the 5 uh, genomic units per gram to about 10 to the 8 genomic units per gram in our biosolids treatment, our effluent treatments around 10 to the 7, and our poultry litter treatments around 10 to the 8. It really leads me to believe that it, if you continually apply uh, some of these uh, manures and biosolids, you can maybe sustain uh, class 1 integron genes. But then what ended up happening is by year three, the levels just came crashing back down again. Now, the, the waste themselves had plenty of it, so that wasn't the issue. Uh, so it leads me to believe, is it part of a cyclical thing? We're just seeing this related to, uh, these guys are already intrinsically there, uh, or are we adding to the system? We're probably a little bit of both. And it's a little bit more complex, and I'm gonna have to work on, on that data to kind of figure out what's going on there. Looking at our, our pathogen levels, and I'm throwing E. coli in there. It's not a pathogen in this case. We're just looking at generic E. coli. Um, and I know for my microbiologists that are in the group, I just wanted to make sure I'm clear about that. Uh, these are generic E. coli, but we're throwing it in the group here. Uh, all three years, this was the most consistently detectable of the pathogens that we looked for. Um, and it was uh, readily uh, uh, related to biosolids and the effluent applied plots. Uh, not so much with poultry litter, certainly. And the control plots, once again, were positive for E. coli probably our feral animals again. Our salmonella isolates. Um, salmonella was not readily detectable, which was disappointing because it is a fairly hardy uh, uh, bacterium and it does tend to last in the environment, but it was not readily detectable. It was in the waste, just not readily detectable in the soil. Um, but when it was, uh, particularly at year three, it appeared that the biosolids plots, and that was surprising to us, uh, that the biosolids plots were the ones that contributed uh, the most salmonella. Campylobacter, we detected it in the waste, but once it got out in the field, it was not detectable, and that's certainly not shocking there. Looking at some of our antibiotic resistance profiles, our antibiograms, this is just a broad uh, scale look here, and this is E. coli. Basically what I want to draw your attention to is for the most part, um, the resistance were uh, to cephalothin and resistance to tetracycline. Uh, there was no imipinum resistance, and there were uh, no, uh, only three isolates, I believe, were resistant to uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, quinolone uh, antibiotics. So that was good. So we were happy about that uh, for the most part. Um, our resistance profiles didn't appear to be related to treatment. So to wrap that up, um, overall it, was a, it appeared that the treatments were all uh, short-term effects, uh, less than 14 weeks for the most part. Uh, the more organic matter you had in the treatment, the longer that per, uh, particular effect uh, persisted. Pathogen levels were low in the soil. Very difficult to find the lone gunman uh, in this case. Uh, we know they're probably there, uh, but even looking at 10 grams, it's going to be difficult to find uh, the pathogen, particularly with background numbers and whatnot. Uh, we did find uh, some of the uh, like E. coli in, in our controls uh, did indicate that there was wildlife there, which is going to cause a problem. And some of our antibiotic resistance uh, suggested at least that there was no treatment bias, at least for E. coli. Uh, so far, that's what we're at there. But what this leads us to is our risk assessment is that we want to make sure that we use the correct assumptions when it comes to risk. Uh, we want to make sure that, that we can somewhat develop uh, risk assessments and inactivation rates based on particular waste products and not just generalized uh, uh, waste. And that's where we're leading with this whole study. Uh, same thing with antibiotic resistance. We're really early on in looking into that. 
Um, but we're, we're, we're continuing on. And with that, I'm going to end. And that's exactly 20 minutes. John, yeah. we have a state rule where poultry litter has to be stored for a month okay. for uh, salmonella elimination before it's transported. Is that would you support that uh, um, rule, and, and do you think that's pretty effective? Yeah, uh, from what we've seen, and we've worked with unstored and stored litter. Uh, that one month is certainly good enough to, to reduce your numbers quite a bit, surprisingly quite a bit. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the studies that we've looked at have been in-house composting approaches, and the storage almost does as good of a job as an in-house composting uh, approach. So, yeah.